Good morning. This is uh, Earl Seamy from Mars. We have with us as well, Ryan Utzman, a 13 year veteran of Mars. We're gonna talk about uh, design for resource restricted teams, which is pretty much a theme for this season, for the upcoming season. Uh, probably uh, any team that is thinking about doing some manufacturing or even new teams, is going to have very restricted access to manufacturing. So um, one of my favorite things about WV Rocks is the early morning on the second, on, towards the end of the 26 hours, teams are finally surviving. Um, you know, see if uh, their machines have held up for 23, 24 hours and uh, the, the students themselves, if they're surviving. It's a nice quiet time, you walk around Half the people are unconscious and, and the robots are still moving. So with that, uh, I think uh, Ryan is gonna lead us off with a question and then he and I will have some discussion and we look forward to your questions on uh, the Twitch uh, chat stream. So Ryan. Sure, so my, the fundamental question for me for this session is uh, basically, what would a Mars robot look like if it was built in a garage with hand drills and hacksaws? How would that change our build process and how would that restricted access to our, our usual machining resources uh, affect our, our build season? So my immediate response to that is we build a kit bot. So whether uh, you're a rookie team or your resource restricted team, I've seen over the last 14 years, a lot of great robots built off of a kit bot frame. And I think that would be a great place to start. What do you think? I totally agree. And then from there, uh, 1114 put together a resource a few years ago called the kit bot in, on steroids, which is some easy enhancements you can make, uh, things like adding extra motors. Uh, I think there is included a, an old Annie Mark shifter um, adding a plywood belly pan to increase rigidity. Um, but it's, it's all easy, accessible upgrades you can make to that kit bot to take it to the next level. Uh, and then uh, last season, I believe it was 7461, put out an updated 2020 edition. Uh, that is, it's a lot of the same things, but they include um, some modifications with some simple 3D printed parts, depending on what you have access for. I've been really amazed over the last couple of years, you know, with kit bots. When we started with Mars 14 years ago, uh, the kit bot concept didn't exist. And it was very much a clean slate for everyone. And, and there's some advantages to that, creativity and so forth. But as we would start to learn how to build a better robot, and we certainly have learned a lot, uh, a lot of the things we thought were very creative or very important all of a sudden started appearing in that base kit bot. Uh, and on the one hand, as a veteran team, you're like, wow, that means everyone knows this stuff. And then you realize, wait, that's the whole point. You know, really that technology is moving out into the community. And so it got to be pretty exciting that you knew if you saw a brand new rookie team and they start off with a kit bot, chances are if they're, if they're in an event, you're gonna be able to help them get moving and get out in the field and have some fun. Yeah, and if you take everything off else off of them, there's not all that much difference between our kind of go-to standard sheet metal drive base and the modern kit bot. They're very, very similar. And it, it's, a, it's a great stable base for teams to start from. Yeah, I, I agree. I think then the next question is, so you have a kit bot and you're gonna play the game and you start thinking about what can I build in my garage with Maybe there's a drill press line around. Maybe you've got ability to cut tubing material. Um, in terms of design strategy, what are, what are your thoughts on what's the next thing? Like, okay, you got a kit bot, you can move. What's the next thing you should do with that limited resource? Uh, so I think from our general, um, the way that we strategize and analyze the game, when we first look at the game and what's important in the game, we aren't looking at, at the beginning at least, what our limits are. So we're identifying the, the high value parts of the game that we should be focusing on. Usually it's climbing or the end game. Uh, usually some of the during the game tasks are more valuable than others. And so whatever those 
whatever those tasks are that we determine are high value, we're going to pick those out regardless of whether we can build something for it or not. And then from there, it turns into a bit of a creativity and research and looking at how previous teams have handled similar challenges. But maybe we would do that research with more focus on what we can do. So climbing, you know, in most years, you extend something linearly and then pull it back down. There are a lot of ways to do that depending on what you have access to. Um, I think one of the, the past few years, one of the great resources for that has been 118's EveryBot. Um, they, they do a great job of analyzing, you know, what's, what are the high value tasks and how can we do it in a very simple and effective way. So this year, I think their climber was, it was PVC and a motor on a strap. Uh, so basically anybody could, uh, could approach that from their, their documentation. I think, you know, you made a good point there by in introducing the idea of PVC. So let's talk about some of the materials you might use in a low resource team. I've seen some amazing robots. I think um, at IRI a couple of years ago, um, which, ro which robot was it that was next to us? It was all wood, uh, it was multicolored Canadian team. Um, oh, um, makeshift. 4039. Fantastic team every year, really uh, creative design. Most of their robot was made of wood. Uh, pretty accessible material in a garage level workshop. So whether it's PVC and being able to, to glue things together using PVC glue and a, and a simple hacksaw to make parts. Uh, PVC is, is great to great material to work with. Pretty, pretty safe, pretty easy to cut, pretty easy to form uh, or wood. I think both of these have some advantages. Now, if you come to a WV Rocks event with a wood or PVC robot, there's a chance it might not last 32 straight matches. Um, but that's not the point. If the goal is to get out and get playing in one event or maybe two events. And because it's such an accessible material, you can have easy spares ready to go. So over the course of the season, it's, it's a pretty easy material that you can not only repair, but iterate on and improve throughout the season, swapping parts one for one. Uh, yeah. 1771 is another one of my go-to wooden robots. They've not made, they've not done primarily wood for a couple of seasons, but from when they came back in 2015 through 2017 or 2018, they were all plywood all the time. It was great. There, there's a bit of Mars uh, lore and humor in my next comment. You know, we're talking about robot materials and what you could build with something simple. We, we within Mars, uh, refer to a robot, and we won't mention any team numbers, is Cardboard the Magic Robot from years ago. And for us, it was, it was both a, a challenge and a like, wow, how did they do that? I mean, some of it was luck, but they ended up, I think, in the finals of a regional? Oh, number one. They were the number one seed and ended up in the finals. And they were primarily, they had a drive base. They had a kit bot drive base, I think. And they were primarily made of cardboard. And for that season, it worked. And, and that material was sufficient and robust enough for them to make it the number one seed uh, at a regional event. Are you pulling up video of that, of that robot? Oh, no, I didn't want to call them out uh, by number. They're, they're not a team anymore, but, but still. Uh. I just had to double check my stats. They, they did finish number one. They did go to the finals at the event. Um, and it was, uh, their entire up structure was built out of the uh, kind of the corrugated plastic Gatorade signs from around the uh, stadium concourse. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but the key, I think in a lot of the, in our discussion right now is that drive base, right? So. Uh, if I was a resource limited team, I invest a good bit of my resources in terms of time. Time is always a resource uh, that you is in such short supply in competition season. I would invest in getting that drive base working. I mean, we've we've seen hundreds of rookie teams struggle to be able to move, and so that number one, if you're going to be out there and you're going to be playing, it is to be able to move. So that's where I'd invest the resources initially. And then, as you said, identifying uh, one or two strategic goals and trying to build to that. Now, in terms of tools, um, if I was, if you're a resource limited team, 
what would be the one tool that you felt like you absolutely needed uh, in a tiny shop? It's hard to pick one, but I think looking at our early years, we got a lot of mileage out of band saws, uh, especially in 2011, we had these uh, curved Lexan fingers. And as we iterated on those throughout the season to find a shape that would work to pick up the game pieces, you know, we would just, we would print out a pattern uh, just on a standard eight by 11 office printer, tape it to a piece of Lexan, could be plywood though, take it to the band saw and trace out the shape and we, we could do that in half an hour and have brand new parts to, to play with. Uh, so I think a bandsaw is pretty flexible, uh, a, a small drill press. Mo most of our early machines were made with those two tools. Yeah, you know, the bandsaw, I've often thought about building a device just for FRC teams to allow them to make really nice straight uh, cuts of stick material for, from a bandsaw. And so, uh, you know, even just with a small guide to be able to make angled cuts so you could uh, build up structures and so forth or, or brace framing, add triangular supports to give some strength to some materials. Uh, a bandsaw is, is probably pretty critical. Uh, even a hand drill you can build a little housing for and turn it into a bit of a drill press. But I, I'd say bandsaw is the first, first step I'd go to. Uh, again, you could easily handle wood and PVC with a fairly inexpensive bandsaw. And then drill press, what, what would be if you had, uh, given we've been able to, to grow and build our tooling uh, capacity right now, what's the one tool now that we have that you wouldn't ever want to give up on again? Uh, the router. Uh, <laughs> as we've been uh, kind of redesigning our 2020 robot, looking forward to 2021, almost all of the parts that I've conceptualized in my head are designed to be made on the router. It just, it makes everything so much easier. <laughs> so let's talk about that. So what we've got is a, uh, a shop bot routers, about a two foot by three foot bed and uh, fairly easily programmable with the software from the vendor. The beauty for us has been accessibility. We as a more mature team have access to sponsors with WaterJet capacity and so forth, but they're real businesses that sometimes we might send them a print and it might be two weeks before we can get a part back because they have real work to do for, for customers. But that shop bot is there all the time. So it's not huge, it, you can't do really big pieces, uh, but it, we can run it 24 hours a day. And after some uh, development work, which we're happy to share with any teams and a lot of the information's out there on the web, we can handle you know, aluminum plates as thick as a quarter of an inch uh, and PVC and Lexan is, is bread and butter. So that kind of tool, um, price is not, it's not trivial. It's gonna to be tough for, for a rookie team, but it may be something that some high schools have, not just in a machine shop, but in like a, an art studio uh, or graphic design studio. So that, that uh, that tool is pretty handy for making pretty advanced robot parts. Yeah, we have a, a very small tabletop router uh, that we use for rocketry in my office. Uh, Todd uses it to cut out little thin balsa wood fins. Um, but talking about the router reminded me of a team I, I judged at Worlds a few years ago. It was 4183 back in 2015. They only had access to a little tabletop. I think theirs was a laser cutter. And they, so they could only cut very thin wood. They made their entire 2015 robot out of parts of wood that they had used joinery to connect all throughout, uh, all throughout their robot. So even though it was, it was a bit on the smaller side, they had that machine available to them that they could run all the time, just pumping out parts out of an easy to get material. Yeah, I think that's probably the key here. Sorry, my cat is playing with his toy uh, right under the microphone. Um, I think the key here is being able to control the tool. And so as, as uh, resource limited teams, um, if you can access a tool, whether it's a bandsaw or a drill press, or in this case, a small router, um, and you can access it all the time, it, it gives you the flexibility to make lots of parts, even if you have to do things uh, 
in small pieces so that they can add up to something more substantial later. Uh, you know, as I look at really good teams, and I'm always envious of creative designs and always, you know, why didn't I think of that as we talk to our design team? I'm always impressed that it really didn't take a lot of resources to build that thing. What it took was a lot of creative thought. And so the next thing I would say for resource uh, restricted teams is to realize that uh, the, the most important resource is, is creative thought. And so if you are, if, if you think carefully about what you want to build, um, you can do some pretty amazing stuff with some very limited resources. Yeah, and there's not, there is to a point, but there's not, like you see in some other competitions, there's a lot of design convergence as the season goes on. Uh, but the way that FRC is structured, there's more flexibility in, you know, the exact mechanism you use to accomplish a task. So if you have something creative that handles the task well, and you can build it kind of quickly and practice and iterate because you're using affordable materials, then you get, as you refine the design over the course of the season, you're going to end up better most times than a team who kind of slapped on something they saw another team do at the last minute to make themselves more competitive. Um, and so those are the teams that uh, put something together quickly and early so that they can practice with it. Those are the teams that scare me when I'm looking at our schedule at an event. Yeah, speaking of being at an event, um, and let's talk about design uh, issues. So I, I'm always guilty, I've been my whole career of being a conservative designer and, and building things that are a little bit too strong, um, hold up a little bit too well. And so what's your thought on uh, investment in structures that you can um, sort of that are disposable versus structures that will hold up uh, longer? Uh, well, I've been uh, working with you for the past 13 years, so I tend to come down on the, the more robust conservative side, even though I think within the team, I try to push crazier ideas. Um, <laughs> but if you're, I think a key is being reliable on the field because you're, you're paying, you know, $5,000 to go to an event, you're playing eight to 15 matches tops. If you uh, if you break during part of that and you can't perform, then that's number of matches under five thousand dollars that you've just you know you're not getting your money's worth out of the event. So I tend to to come down on the side of uh, reliability more than making it work once or twice. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I've often heard people talk about the the cost per match of an FRC event. It's high. Uh, competition is fantastic, and so that, that that's the balance. Uh, so let's put in a plug for WV Rocks 2021. Uh, we typically have an admission fee of about $250 and about 30 events. So you can do the math there. It's about $10 a match. So uh, we have pretty amazing uh, cost-benefit analysis for WV Rocks. So in the spring of 2021, we hope to put out a call for 24 teams to come play and last for 26 hours. So uh, you might wanna make your parts more robust. To, to make that call a little bit more generic, I think off season events in general are a great, uh, a great resource for teams that are trying to, to stretch their, their budget, especially this year we kind of know you know what the game is in advance depending on how things are in your local area there may be some small gathering of teams at some point um it's going to be less than five thousand dollars and you're going to get uh, a little bit more time uh, with the controllers in hand i expect uh, so we usually go to, to two or three off-season events in a summer to train up new students and get them exposed to frc but it's also a chance to to, to show off more of the hard work that the students put in throughout the season uh, for, so, a, for a much lower cost. Speaking of tips for rookie teams, one of the questions we had uh, written in was what's the most important tip we could give to a rookie team? We've been around from first. We're not certainly not one of the oldest teams in first, but now a, a 2000 member team seems 
be on the older side. I remember when we were always the new kids on the block. Um, what are your thoughts? I should add for any viewers we have that I have always considered Ryan to be the Wikipedia at first. If we're in a meeting and I have a question about something first related, I don't look it up. I just say, hey, Ryan, what's the answer? And he invariably uh, has an answer on the tip of his tongue. So we'll see how he does with this tough question. Usually I can stall long enough that I can look it up on the Blue Alliance or Chief Delphi. Um, my struggle is really with the, the biggest piece of advice. I think uh, there's, there's, so, there's so many things to choose from and, and we ready of, you know, build within your means. Um, that's, I think I pulled that from a Karthik presentation. Um, you know, uh, building within your means, um, uh, focusing on high value strategy in the game, um, build reliably. I, I guess my biggest uh, piece of advice for a rookie team would be, uh, you know, it's it's very hard, but it's very hard for everybody. So even the teams that maybe look from a distance like they have it all together and they're just coasting through and everything's going right for them, you know, it wasn't always that way and it probably isn't right now. You're, you're kind of seeing their highlight reel at an event. Uh, they had the same struggles that you did earlier in the season. Uh, so, so actually, no, now I've picked my best piece of advice and that's to talk to other teams and, and grow that sense of community um, because then you can lean on their experience. Um, you can, you know, maybe they've got a bandsaw and, and you don't, you can, you know, swap tools, share some capability. And I think that, that, uh, that networking and sense of community adds a lot to the FRC experience. There are, uh, you know, teams that we've played with over and over throughout the years that we've developed a sense of camaraderie with. And I think that adds something really special to the competitions. Uh, and it's always, uh, it provides a, a group of teams that we're always looking to during the season as we're developing our ideas that we can, you know, bounce things off of. So yeah, re reach out to local teams, get in touch and uh, network and make friends. So I'm, I'm gonna broaden that question out a little bit because I think, you know, we think immediately about competitiveness. Sometimes when we hear that question, what's the best tip for a rookie team? Um, what I'm gonna suggest is the question's a little bit broader, right? I, I've seen a lot of teams come and go. I've always been amazed. I remember our rookie season, I tell a little first history. A rookie season, uh, another team in a nearby town was coming out of very wealthy prep school. And they were a rookie, I think the same year we were a rookie. And we were like, oh my goodness, they're, they're just gonna crush us. They have so many more resources and they're going to just be overwhelming. You know, how, how do we compete against a team like that? They're not a team anymore. And I, I think that's the, the rookie tip that I'd, I'd give rookies, which is what's sort of your, your goal, right? Um, in my field, in the sciences, as a person who develops new science experiments, there's always a difference between a project and a program, right? A project is something you do and a program is something that's sustained. And so, if you're a rookie team and you want to sustain, if, if you want to be a team five years from now, 10 years from now, that's the question to ask. You know, what's the most important tip I can give you to survive 10 years? Well, this is gonna sound a little strange, but probably the most important person in that 10 year lifespan is gonna be a coach or a mentor or a single sponsor that really has a passion for keeping the team alive. Because things go up and down, right? There's always challenges, as Ryan just said. Um, teams go through struggles. Um, five years ago, we lost our co-founder uh, suddenly and unexpectedly. And, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, if had it just been one of us uh, leading the team, the team would have probably folded. So my most important tip to a rookie team is to identify a person who's committed to supporting the team for the long term. Now that person may change. One of our partner teams in the southern part of our state, we start off with one fantastic teacher and after a few years she retired and a new fantastic teacher has taken over the team. But there's 
there's got to be someone who's going to be around and, and, you know, do the stuff that really is behind the scenes. So that would be tip one uh, is to find um, someone who's going to sustain the team. The second tip would be, as we think about competitiveness, Mars has been real fortunate to, to compete on the national stage a bunch of times. But as we always tell our team, you can't control what happens on the field. Uh, you know, I would have never thought in our 13th year, we'd have a match where we went dead on the field. We just, you know, Mars, we don't, we try never to do that again. As you said, it's $500 uh, per match and to watch a robot brick on the field is, is an incredibly frustrating thing, but we had a loose battery connection, you know, it just didn't get crimped right. And it didn't, it didn't appear in our pre-testing and we went on the field, we hit something, we just went dead. And uh, you can't control it. So in terms of building your program and building your competitiveness, uh, a rookie team should focus on those things that are really in their control. And that's building their program, building their community, connectivity to other teams. Um, when you're competing at FRC events, putting a lot of emphasis and, and effort into things they can control, competing for engineering inspiration, competing for chairmen, doing the things that make a team be a program uh, and not a project. And so that'd be my other advice for a rookie team. It, it is more than just a robot. Yeah, I agree 100%. So uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat thread. So if anyone's out there, I know we have about 20, 25 people watching the thread, hopefully. So um, let me look up uh, another question we got earlier, which is how do you form better relationships with sponsors? So what do you think? So I think it's, hmm. I think it's important uh, to pursue a diverse set of sponsors uh, so that if, if one major one drops off, you still have uh, support elsewhere. But I, I think in terms of making those connections better, uh, you know, periodic check-ins, uh, sending them letters and updates annually, not just, you know, taking their money and, and being done with it. Um, I think it's important to to get your students in front of those sponsors. So maybe offer to do presentations so that they can see firsthand the impact that their donation is having and the impact that your program is having. Um, that's what we do. So that's that's my go to answer <laughs> is, uh, yeah, yeah. is check in frequently and keep them up, up to date on all of the great things that you're doing. And then as you develop that relationship and uh, show that you know, your, your program is a good return on their investment, then uh, when things maybe hit a slump or don't go so smoothly, then uh, they're more likely to stick around. And, and so I think a, an important part of that is to, like Earl mentioned, focus outside of competition, focus on the, the real impact you're having on your students' lives, not necessarily on your win-loss record. Uh, because that can change at any moment, depending on, you know, how the schedule gets randomized at the next event. Uh, so you should make sure that you're focusing on more than just the competition. So uh, I, of course, agree. That's the way we run our program. Yesterday, I got a check for $50 from a sponsor. And uh, our outreach public relations team has been on the ball this summer, um, reaching out to all our sponsors. And I, I think being a little more aggressive this year, knowing with the pandemic and, and companies are struggling, that we're gonna have to spread out uh, our, because a couple of our sponsors have already cut us back 30, 40% of what they can donate this coming year. So we're trying to uh, rebuild our diversity of sponsor base. And as Ryan says, uh, communication. So probably the most critical thing. And, and, and to be fair, um, over the last couple of years, Mars has probably become a little too stra um, narrow in some of our sponsor base. I, I think we've, we've been able to land some really big sponsors and it gives you a false sense of security. You're like, oh, well, you know, maybe I don't need to do as much uh, development <clears throat> with my sponsors. Uh, but uh, since I've worked on the, in the development world, the fundraising world, 
you know, you make contacts in year one that may be mature in year five or year 10. And so that's, it's the same process for a team. And, and remember that could be um, bringing mentors into the team or bringing new students into the team. It's that same networking for, for teams that aren't in a school where you sort of have a constant uh, churn of students every year. Community-based teams have to go out and recruit. So everything you do to sort of get out in the community uh, so sponsors feel like they're contributing to something that's making a difference, I think is pretty critical, especially for rookie teams. I, I, you know, I don't know if people still say it in the first world, but I've always thought the second year of a team was the toughest year. The first year you can get a NASA grant that kind of pays your way uh, to get into that first event. Uh, but that second year or it, second or third year, that's the real challenge, right? Now you've got to switch from being a so, single point sponsored team to, to really starting to diversify. And I think a, a few years ago, we saw that some with um, JC Penny teams. There, there were a bunch of new teams popping up with, you know, first or second year, your grant money. And then as that grant money went away, those teams dropped off at a higher rate. Um, so it's really, really important to, you know, diversify your, your sponsor pool because uh, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I think I, a couple of years ago, I ran some numbers and looked at, you know, what are the chances historically that a, an N year team comes back for year N plus one. And for every, every single value there, every age of team, the return rate for the next year was between 80 and 85%. So even though they all happen at the same rate because there are more rookie teams than, you know, second year teams, then more rookies will drop off. Um, but, but you've got an 80 to 85% chance of coming back for your next season throughout so FRC that, history. So if those statistics are correct, then coming back for two years is 64%, three years is about 50%. Yep. Four years is 40%. Five years is 32%. Six years is into the 20s yep yeah i you know we've seen that and, and as you have uh, mentioned earlier building that sense of community with other teams i think is one of the, the things that helps you survive right e even at a coach level i mean you and i have been coaching for a long time you started off as a student on the team but you know there are years where you think well maybe i'm done maybe i'm done with this <laughs> And then you talk to some other coaches <clears throat> or you, you meet up with some other teams and you see uh, there's something that happens with that team that year. There's, there's some amazing uh, impact on a student's life or in the community. And, you, and it reminds you why uh, you're doing this uh, because for, from a coaching standpoint, it's a lot of, a lot of investment. And so as you can get inspired, the, the I in first, not just from your own team, but seeing other teams. And, and unless as a rookie, as a new team, unless you're making those connections to those other teams, I think you miss out on opportunities to be inspired. And so that's a pretty critical thing for a new team. And it's tough, like, you know, in a state like ours where there are only four teams, it's not like we can go across town and, and see the competitor high school team and hang out with, with them on a, at some event. You know? Yeah, and I think, after our fourth or fifth year, we started putting a real, you started putting in a real concerted effort to make these connections with other teams at competition. And I think it's, it's paid off a lot since then that we've, uh, we've made a lot of friends that make the competition a lot more fun. <laughs> I mean, we've been in competitions in the last couple of years where teams thought we were a Tennessee team because we were, we had so many friends from Tennessee. So that's, if I, if we have any Tennessee folks on the, uh, the line listening yeah we're we're part tennessee team too i think it's kind of funny so let's uh since it's a quiet morning if you were at wv rocks 2020 right now and it's uh 8 30 in the morning what would be happening so based on the past couple of west virginia rocks i would probably have been um pressed into serving as a referee and i probably would have just finished my overnight shift and was about to take a half hour coffee and donut break before I get back to it. 
uh, I never schedule myself. Well, okay, the first time I scheduled myself as the head ref, that was uh, not how you should have your first FRC refing experience. Um, uh, but I at least had backup that year. And then uh, two years ago, I didn't sign up as a ref, but assign myself to be a ref because we were short. And then the same thing happened uh, at the last rocks as well. So it, it, it seems to be a tradition for me. Yeah, I just, I love going through the pits uh, after hour 20 or so. I mean, there are teams, the spectrum is so broad. Some teams are literally coming up with new ideas and are building a new component for their robot. They've decided to take those 20 hours where they're together and use it as a build moment. And you know, you walk past another pit and there's just six kids unconscious on the floor with a coach barely trying to, uh, to stay, stay awake. Um, but the robots are out there, you know, very fast cycle times, the, the kids, I, I think it's a real testament to uh, engineering to see these machines try and last 30 matches straight for perspective, as we were talking about before with, uh, you said in a regional event, you might play eight, 10 matches. So this is sort of three regionals back to back um, in terms of wear and tear on the machine and the drivers. Yeah, and we, uh, there are some teams who come to West Virginia Rocks and play twice as many matches as they played during the regular season. Um, there are some teams who, it's still a lot of matches, but uh, I think two years ago, we helped one of the teams at the event hit the uh, the high mark in FRC for matches played in the season. Um, it was a Michigan team and they had gone to an extra district event as well. And they qualified for Michigan States and Worlds. They played in a couple of off season events and then they came to rocks. So they played something like 220 matches in the season. It was, it was wild. Is that the team that didn't win, went on to win oh, next year? I don't know if they won worlds, but they won rocks. So they played as many matches as they yeah. could have. <laughs> I think I have that video queued up. Should we watch some WV rocks video? Sure. Let's take a, a let's take a, a video break. I, I haven't seen, I, I'm desperate for FRC action. So even if I'm, if I have to uh, watch old video, <laughs> I'm tempted to. So let's see. We're talking uh, 2018 WV Rocks, I think. Is that yes, right? Yes, 2018. And it was uh, 35 38 Robo Jackets. They yeah. played 183 matches that year. I believe they between... went to compete on Einstein uh, that year. Um, and, and do quite well. So let's see if I can share my screen and uh, bring them up. Yes, they went to Einstein in 2019. 20, uh, yeah, they played 11 events in 2018. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, for those of you who've never had a chance to, to be at WV Rocks, um, I'm going to ask Ryan to make sure he can see my screen. I'll make this full screen here if I can. There we go. Ryan, you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, so we have uh, the West Virginia oh. University Rec Center. Uh, so the facility is basically a big gymnasium with, uh, there's a swimming pool and another gym we use as a resting area. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, refs and FTAs, um, CSAs come from all over the country uh, to be in rocks. They, they see it as much of a challenge for them as, um, as we do, it's a lot of Our fun. head referee flew out from Washington. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, finals uh, 2018 power up. This is the, uh, the end of, so these teams will have played like 35 matches straight for 26 hours plus a practice match. And uh, I think this is finals, finals one. So uh, let's sit back and watch some FRC action. Wait, I think I need to make sure that I put the screen sharing. Yeah, share my computer sound. This should make it better. Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. We're here in the finals of WV Rocks 2018. We have Alliance 1 in red versus Alliance 2 in blue. This call comes down to this. Every power cube matters, every motion matters. 
We end autonomous mode with commanding cubes in all locations of the switches and the scale. Team 1629 assisting their partners. Team 2614 trying to balance out that scale in the center of the field. Blue Alliance in control of their switch. Blue Alliance also is seemingly in control of the Red Alliance switch as well. 4575, the Tin Mints continuing to place those power cubes to stop the Red Alliance from gaining any points from their switch. 179. Utilizing that activator system with that angular actuator to try and place that power cube down. 2614 and Gecko still attempting to place power cubes. It's a game of scale right here. Which, al which alliance will the scale be tipped in favor of? You can fit so many power cubes. They're just finding more and more real estate for this location. 4575, the 10 mints continuing to place power cubes try and gain firm control of the Red Alliance switch. Blue Alliance still in control of their switch, so they're still gaining one point per second off of that. We have an unofficial score of 163 to 108, favoring the Red Alliance, but we still have 60 seconds remaining. It could be anyone's game. We have a steady increase of scores. Red Alliance activating a lot of power-ups. They're just activating their uh, boost power-up at the moment. That's a level three, doubling the points from their switch in the scale. Red Alliance also had activated a Levitate plus a Force as well. Blue Alliance still up for grabs with their Power Cubes in the vault. 35 seconds remaining, still in favor of the Red Alliance, but Blue Alliance is creeping back up a little bit. 30 seconds remaining as we move towards the end game of Finals 1. Here at WB Rocks at West Virginia University, Gecko and Mars trying to find any last Power Cubes. Mars going to park on the platform a little bit early. Let's see what their plan of action is. 179. Children of the Swamp looking to grab themselves up, 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 and away they go. 35, 38, trying to climb on the side of the pole. Blue Alliance activating their Levitate power up. Five seconds remaining. Can 26, 14 get on the climb? Time equals zero here. So that was uh, 2018 finals, WV Rocks. And let me make sure I can still see the feed from the Twitch stream, see if any questions pop up. Ah, it makes me miss with WV uh, Rock FRC competitions. And I think I know the uh, writer of that comment. Makes me miss it too. It's been a, it's been a rough year without FRC. So we're looking forward to 2021. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about rookie teams. So I have a bit of video to show that's very old and uh, kind of grainy. And it shows the first Mars robot built. And uh, we were, uh, we didn't have a place to practice. So we would carry our 120 pound robot upstairs across campus and use it in a meeting room at the student union. And so, um, Ryan's not in his picture. It was the first year of the team and he wasn't on the team. But no, but I remember making that hike. <laughs> so let's see if I can bring up that video. Um, and I think I have it queued up. Let me see if I have it queued up here. Yes, I do. So now I need to share it. So this is not the way to build a robot. We learned a lot of things not to do in 2018. But for a little Mars humor, uh, okay, can you see that, Ryan? I can, 2008. <laughs> yeah, 2008. Yeah, we learned so, a lot about building robots in 2018, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. How, what not to do, but uh, so this is, it's, it's not quite a kit uh, base because they didn't have kit robots back then. Um, but we did have some access to some uh, machining ca ca capability. There is some PVC on the robot. And uh, this is the Mars rookie robot. And the most important thing is it moves. Boy. By the way, the same reporter lady, she was filming the uh, school board thing while I was speaking. So. But I wasn't pointing towards her, so I think she just videotaped my back. I don't know if that's going to be on TV or not, but 
Yeah, pretty much. Hey, release the ball so I get a shot of it. Please. Kind of meant over a line. But not sure. Um, <laughs> there's so much wrong with that robot. It it's uh. My my favorite feature is that because of the sizing rules that year, you couldn't actually open both claws at the same time. You would have to you move one arm back and then the other. That's right. And let me say that the the sound level was not amplified. The robot was really that loud. So we have we've heard many robots over the years that sounded like blenders eating pieces of machinery. That was sort of at that level. That that robot. Um, with probably the dumbest drive base and drive scheme I've ever seen on a robot, and that was a Mars robot. We beat it in 2009. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, traction wheels in the front and unpowered omnis in the back, so it just pivoted wildly around the front whenever you tried to turn, which was, it worked for 2008, I think. It, it worked, except, you know, so 2008, you had to drive in circles. So it was like NASCAR, you're always making the left turn. And um, we'd go around turns and the whole back end of the robot was just fly around. <laughs> it made drift steering uh, sort of a thing, sort of the ultimate drift steer robot. Uh, but in terms of rookie uh, materials, that robot was built in the classroom, mostly with a drill press uh, we had a little access to a little welding, and uh, and that was with one of our sponsors. The the big thing for us, you know, sort of two or three weeks in was to be with the team. And so 15, 16 days, I think, into the build season, we actually had a moving robot. And and now as an, as an experienced team, you know, we can probably make a robot move. I think we've done it in like three hours, build out a wooden platform kit bot, screw some speed controllers on, throw some code on it, and probably be moving in a couple hours. But as a rookie team, I still remember, you know, it was two weeks before we could get anything to move. Uh, and, and that was a big moment, was just getting out there and being able to move. So uh, in terms of tips for rookies, being able to move, getting your uh, a moving robot out in front of sponsors, and uh, being able then to start training drivers so they have some experience with the controls. What was your favorite thing uh, about that, that first robot? Um, that I didn't have to actually compete with it. Uh, I didn't come in until a few weeks after the 2008 World Championship. Uh, so I just got to hear the stories. Um, but my first FRC robot was uh, Marvin II in 2009, which is the robot we don't talk about anymore. Uh, it's the, why, the one. And why don't we talk about that robot? Um, a, um, it was terrible, and uh, B, it's the only year we didn't make it to Worlds. Uh, it okay. was. We learned a lot uh, about not building robots in 2009. Um, the drive base was it was a custom drive base that could pivot the wheels from in line to 45 degrees, and because they were low frac low friction that year they could uh, translate and slide around, which was really cool. Uh, but to hold up to the stress of pivoting those wheels back and forth with pneumatics, uh, we made the whole thing out of steel. And so we were 119.9 pounds. Um, we built right to the limits of the 28 by 38 sizing box. Uh, and so to, to get the robot into the sizing box for inspection, there was a lot of shoving and scraping off the welds and the paint that was the first year we powder coated and it did look very nice, but we had to, there's only one powder coat of it in the state that was big enough for a full size 28 by 38 by whatever the height limit was robot. So, but we've uh, kept that partnership through the years and they still do, uh, they still donate time and resources to us and they're a really great partner. So, you know, I, I think for me, 2009, yeah, that was, a, as we said, the second year is a challenge year, right? We didn't have the big NASA grant uh, full. There was like a second year, smaller version. We hadn't built up sponsors. We still didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and 
I know from a, from a coaching perspective, we lost focus sort of partway through the build season. Not that we weren't there working every day and students weren't really involved, but I think we, we didn't have enough of a plan. We, we didn't have enough of a plan of, of how we, we wanted to accomplish our goals. We got more focused on the individual tasks than the, the goals in the game. Yeah. And, and so we ended up with a robot that really, while I could move, couldn't really do anything else. And there wasn't much else in the game to do. It was, you know, lots of people aren't huge fans of that, that game design uh, because there weren't a lot of different things a robot could try and do. And since we had trouble doing the one main thing, we really struggled. And, and I think it taught us a lot about uh, design focus. So I'm getting a text as, uh, as we're talking about the, 20, the 2008 robot, uh, favorite things. Uh, my texter says uh, his favorite thing was the soldering iron traction on that robot. And so uh, because <laughs> the wheels kept getting um, smoothed down, running on carpet, uh, the students would jam hot soldering irons <laughs> into the wheels <laughs> to build up traction on the wheels uh, that year, if I recall. I tried to block some of that out of my mind. But. We've actually used that technique since then. It's not ideal, but if, you, uh, if your wheels aren't easy to swap and you're in a pinch, I think that was 2017. That's right. You just bubble up the, the, the Colson wheel a bit with a hot siring iron. It's not so the right tool for the job, but it worked. <laughs> Okay, well, we've got uh, nine minutes left. Hopefully we get some questions here. We've had a chance to talk about uh, young teams. Um, we, we, of course, have more WV Rocks uh, video. We can always show a lot of it's up on Blue Alliance. One of the nice things about Rocks is we have a good overhead view and we stream on our, with our partners Twitch um, for the event and they do a great job of giving us live stream. And uh, the DJs do a good job we're trying to keep people up for 26 hours. So uh, while we have a few minutes left, what is your favorite specialty match at WV Rocks? The silent matches are so fun. Uh, just all you can hear are robots, the music's off. There's no clapping or cheering. Well, there's not supposed to be, but occasionally somebody bursts out and they can't help themselves. And that's always funny. Uh, but I think the silent matches are a lot of fun. Yeah, it's just, it's so different from what you've ever sort of seen at FRC event. And, and you never really get to hear the robots uh, cl uh, hitting into each other at a normal event. And I think the, the MCs have a great uh, time trying to come up with ways to engage the crowd <laughs> without speaking and doing the introductions. You know, we still do, we do the introduction of all six teams every match um, for 26 hours. <laughs> and uh, the MCs, I think have a lot of fun with that. My, my favorite, and we haven't really been able to do it, well, it sort of alters between the, the lights out matches because we never can get it as dark as we always want uh, for safety reasons. But I think the specialty matches we come up with, that, that one with Stronghold in 2016, where we pulled all the defenses, I think we pulled all the defenses. So every robot just had total free access. And then it had as many balls as we could possibly have so human players could throw cross field and try and score. And the buzzer went off and, you know, 30 balls. It's like um, the old game asteroids. All the missiles just start appearing and crossing over from side to side. Uh, and all these balls land on the field. It was a lot of fun. So if you were uh, specialty matches for 2021 with this game, what would you, what would be your favorite specialty match? With this game, I'd like to do, this is kind of my go-to idea every year, but I'd like to, I'd like to take one of the balls and put a steel core in it and make it really heavy. Um, and I know that there are, especially with the velocities that we're throwing them, that there is a safety issue there, but we had weighted cubes in 2018. Uh, I just there was an old FTC game where some of the balls had magnetic cores, and you had to sort them out using that magnetic property. And I I just really enjoyed that, so I I always try to bring it back. Um, 
maybe blocking off uh, the the trench so the teams have to go underneath uh, through the I can't remember the names of the structures right now through the cage <laughs> <laughs> over the bumps is the important part um, kind of a, a stress the, test the halfway switch, through the, the event the generator switch yes yes um, I don't know if it's something that can be easily modified but I'd like to see a variant of the game where balancing requires less than eight degrees of of tolerance. I think that that's a pretty wide margin. It would be interesting to see uh, how teams change their approach if they had to make it tighter. Yeah, I, to, to me, that would be a, a great, a great opportunity would be to tighten up the balancing so you really had to be balanced. Um, you really can't change the, the height of things on the field. So you know, there's, there'll be the classic uh, lights out matches and coach drive matches, which will embarrass you and me probably yet again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think, uh, okay. Uh, my cats have decided to uh, tear my house off <laughs> while I'm on the call. So uh, now I've lost my train of thought. So uh, specialty matches for, for this game. Uh, I'm curious to see what our fans would have. So, you know, we would always take uh, suggestions for additional uh, specialty matches. I see uh, we've got, to, well, Madeline has posted in the, in the Twitch, in the Twitch stream, the lights out matches for sure. Um, Cause you come out in the middle of the night and everything's dark and the robots are just playing there with their, with their lights. I think, um, one thing we've thought about in the past and we've never had enough courage to do, and that's where you have to drive your other partner's robots. Yeah, I would be, uh, I would be hesitant to do that depending on how the schedule came out. Yeah. <laughs> Depends who might be driving our robot. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.